we're good to go. So, hi everyone, um, I'm Lalita Sairam. Um, I'm a postdoc in the Bison group, um, uh, that is Sun Stars and Exoplanet group. Um, I, uh, just to introduce myself uh, and my track, I did my uh, PhD way back uh, in 2013. Uh, I completed it from University of Hamburg in Germany. And since then, I've been moving around doing uh, postdocs and finally landed here. Currently, what I work on has nothing to do with uh, what I'm going to talk. However, this is all uh, from my past that I'm going to talk about uh, today. So to uh, go directly into the talk, I uh, come from India, so growing up in India, one of the astronomical source that was abundantly available for me was, of course, the sun. And uh, hence, I started my academic career uh, looking at sun, uh, studying sun. And sun is very unique an object, uh, according to me, although this has been a field that has been studied for decades now. It is, in fact, one of the most mature fields of astronomy, uh, you can uh, see. And despite that, sun continues to puzzle us till date. Sun is also really a great entity uh, from the fact that it is so near to us, we can perform high resolution observations of sun and solar surface, and we can also produce high contrast images of surfaces on the sun. And which is essential because by observing sun in high contrast, we can compare or we can predict what kind of features we see on stars and interpolate uh, what these features might be because stars are primarily unresolved. However, that's not the only uh, thing. Stars also provide enough of uh, input when we look at sun because sun is just one uh, object that is close to us, but stars come in different flavors. So stars have different masses, different rotation, different ages. So by studying stars um, which are younger than sun and which are older than sun, we can look at sun itself in time and compare its property, how sun will behave well in future as well when we are not around. So throughout my talk, I will try and uh, see about um, make sure that I do not separate these two, that is sun and stars. I will not read them in isolation, but I will try my level best to uh, keep them connected. So jumping directly into the atmosphere of uh, sun, which we all know there are three uh, main uh, atmospheric layers. The first one is photosphere, the surface layer, followed by chromosphere, which extends to thousands of uh, kilometers. And uh, then following that is corona, which has a typical temperature of millions of degrees Kelvin. In fact, corona is uh, one of the most fundamental question uh, that has posed us till date, which we do not have an answer for. Why is corona so hot when compared to uh, photosphere and chromosphere? And a lot of people have tried to answer that, including me, and still the question remains open. So looking at uh, the bottommost layer of the atmosphere, uh, that is photosphere, this is primarily the optical region of the sun that we look at. And uh, this can be best described by a black body uh, emission uh, emergent spectrum. And using simple Wien's displacement law, we know that this region has a temperature of around 5,800 Kelvin. And when we 
look at right in the center of the sun, we know that it's bright and uh, luminous uh, and high temperature uh, region can be seen. Whereas when you look at the limb of the sun, the light takes a slight slanted direction to reach us. And uh, this is because of cooler material that is around the uh, limb and which produces something called as limb darkness. However, what I want to focus on are the features that we see on the sun. One of the most prominent feature on the sun that we can think of and which can be detected just like that, even by going out on any good day where you can see the sun and its surface is of course the spots. So a spot is nothing but it is depressions that is created on the surface of the sun. And these um, uh, depressions are primarily magnetic in nature. So a spot uh, region is much, much cooler than its surrounding uh, region uh, around the sun. And as I said, these are magnetic depression. So when you look at uh, the uh, spot region, these magnetic field lines are so strong that they inhibit any convective motion that is happening from the interior of the sun. As a result, this uh, region becomes much cooler and they have much more stronger magnetic fields. And if we look at the spots itself, you can distinctly uh, see two separate regions over there. One is the umbra, that is the darker uh, shadow uh, that is produced by the uh, magnetic field. And surrounding this darker shadow is penumbra region, which is much, much lighter in nature. And typically, the uh, spots on the surface of sun uh, evolves over a period of days or so. And these spots tend to move along the surface of the sun. And that is what we use, in fact, uh, to uh, measure the rotation period of the sun. The next uh, most prominent feature that we see on sun is faculae. This is plural for the term facula or uh, it is typically a torch. Uh, that's what the meaning is in uh, Latin. What faculae is, is it is a hydrogen uh, network uh, of gas that is uh, floating around the surface uh, of the uh, sun, uh, very close to the spots. And because uh, of the name torch, that is these are brighter regions, what they tend to do is they um, contribute to the total irradiance that you measure from the sun. So when you have sun, which is just dominated by spot, what you would see is the total irradiance coming from the sun would be much lower. And if it is dominated by facula, then you would see the irradiance to go up uh, during uh, facula dominated uh, solar surface. And these are much larger structures, but there are much smaller structures uh, that you see on the surface of the uh, sun as well. One is what to do with the convective currents, that is granulation. So we do know that because of convection, fluid are constantly, heated fluid are constantly moving along the column in the solar uh, surface. And these uh, fluid which are heated, they tend to move up, radiate, and then they go back. Uh, as they go back, they cool down and again continue this process. And this is called as convective uh, motion. And then this happens, at times these uh, fluid gets trapped. And that is what you see here uh, in this region, uh, which forms a convective cell. And typically these convective uh, cells, the larger cells, looks like a rice grain and hence the name granulation. Not very fancy uh, name, uh, but uh, just because it looks like a rice grain. And these granulations have uh, typically a um, time scale of eight to 20 minutes uh, of the order of uh, minutes. And uh, they have a size of around 1000 kilometers in diameter. There are also much larger uh, granules, uh, granulation structures that are seen, and those are called the supergranules. 
so these super granules have a radius uh, diameter of around 35,000 kilometers, much, much larger. And they are usually measured by Doppler uh, shift. So what you see is the material that is moving away from you. They are usually redshifted by measuring that. You uh, find uh, these structures. And these um, super granular structures tend to have a much longer lifetime uh, than order of minutes. They tend to uh, last about a day or so. And what is interesting about these uh, granular uh, structure is also as the um, material is moving up, uh, exactly like granulation, the heated uh, plasma is moving up. They also move along magnetic field lines and they carry bundles of these magnetic field lines and bring it towards the edges, which forms a feature that you would see in chromosphere. It's called chromospheric network. So you can see that there are a lot of these features that we see uh, are not just associated with photosphere, but they tend to have connection to other layers of atmosphere as well. But going back to uh, the larger feature that is spots on the surface of the sun, we know that they tend to um, mimic the rotation of the uh, sun as they come in view and out of view. They also have another feature which we all know about that is the sunspot uh, cycle. So the spots on the surface of the sun, as I said, uh, is easiest to observe. And it was for first time observed from Galilean era. So even during those days, it was observed. And since then, we have the record of spots. May not be to the um, temporal resolution as today, but we have um, enough of data that is available since uh, Galilean times. And what was noticed um, later on was these spots tend to have a periodic variation. That is, there are times on sun where we see a lot of spots, and there are times on sun where we see no spots at all. And uh, this follows the 11 year um, activity cycle that we knew about. What was also found out later on by Carrington was these spots also prefer their location where they fall. So during activity minima, when there are very little spots that are seen on the sun, what you uh, tend to see is they prefer a latitude that is closer to the equator. And when the sun reaches activity maxima, you see that the uh, spots tend to move much higher away from the equator. It's not way higher all the way to the pole, although it is only around the 30 degree latitude uh, that we see for sun at least. But you see that uh, they uh, have a preference in their location. And that is uh, what is known as butterfly diagram. And that was uh, for first time introduced by uh, Carrington. However, there is another thing that we know about sun is it likes to flip its magnetic field as well. So this magnetic field, instead of taking the 11 year cycle, it flips over a period of 22 years. So what uh, it means is during one activity cycle phase, that is during the 11 years, sun might have the north pole, uh, which is facing towards the north. And as it goes to the next activity uh, uh, cycle, when it ends, it starts moving towards um, uh, South Pole. If we need to have an anal uh, analogy to this sitting here in Birmingham, say you take a compass today, measure where your North Pole is, and say it points in one direction. And uh, during the next activity cycle, you come back, you measure, so it will start pointing towards the uh, South. So your magnetic North Pole and South Pole switches. And this is uh, known to be very common in sun, and that is what is detected here. But this is about sun. I, I did say uh, what about the uh, stars, and I will try and uh, cover that part here. 
do we see spots on stars? Of course, yeah, we do see spots on uh, stars. However, we don't have the fancy images that we see on uh, sun. What we do see is the variation in brightness. As I said, when there are more spots, what happens is your uh, brightness of the star tends to be much darker. It, it looks much darker. And when there are lesser spots, then it tends to be much, um, much, much brighter. And these um, it keeps varying depending on whether the spot is in view or out of view. And what you see here is one such uh, depiction of activity um, uh, related to rotation of the star. Uh, although this is just a schematic picture of sun that is taken just to show how this uh, rotation period looks like in the star. If we do not have photometric observations like this, brightness variation like this, and say I just take a spectra, then how does it look? This is how it will look because when we um, speak about spots, we are speaking about magnetic field lines. And what magnetic field lines are good at uh, doing is affecting atomic species. As a result, what you see is deformation in atomic species when you measure uh, some line. So this uh, particular line, you can see that when there is a spot, you can see the line is deformed by taking temporal uh, spectra uh, again and again, you can uh, measure what was the size of the spot and how much it affected and so on. This is with just respect to spot on rotation time scale. However, we do see something that is very similar to our uh, sun that is activity cycle. What you see here is brightness variation in, uh, for one particular star. And this measurement spans over a period of around 2,000 days, it has been measured. And what you see is a, a sinusoidal day, which has a period of about four years. Uh, and you can see um, that it's not only measuring the cycle, but you can also forecast. Today, say, I want to observe this particular star. Today is somewhere over here, and you know what phase the star is, whether the star is in its activity maxima or minima and so on. What is uh, interesting is, although I said like sun, we do have cycle, but you, you would have already noticed that this is four years. So uh, what we have seen dramatically is there are stars which have cycles, which is of the order of just four months. And there are stars which also shows activity cycles, which is of the order of 20 years or more as well. So what most of us have been trying to do is to look at what is the reason for the spot uh, cycle to be of certain period? What makes it uh, smaller? Or what makes it uh, longer? And when it does, whether it has any implication on for instance, if there is a planet that is orbiting around the star as well, and so on. With this input into the photosphere of sun and stars, I'll move to the next layer of atmosphere, that is chromosphere. So for first time, chromosphere uh, was uh, detected during a solar eclipse. So uh, until then, uh, most of sun that we knew was just a photosphere. So uh, during one of the eclipses, what was seen was a red flash uh, because most of the surface of the sun was uh, covered at that point. Immediately, people started to wonder whether this is got to do with sun and the phenomenon uh, that is occurring on sun or whether it has got to do with our terrestrial uh, effect because we are observing the sun sitting over here, whether our Earth's atmosphere was creating this. To uh, investigate this further, spectra were taken uh, by uh, during the next eclipse, and that was uh, when they found that there were a lot of atomic species that were associated with this particular uh, line, that uh, this particular feature that they were looking at, and it had something to do with chromosphere and corona rather than uh, being terrestrial.
And since then, um, what has been done is uh, a lot of them have used the H alpha filter or uh, calcium uh, filters in the ultraviolet region to look at sun in chromosphere, which is the most sensitive uh, wavelengths the uh, chromosphere can be observed. And as you can see, there are tremendous amount of features that you can see on the surface uh, of uh, sun, especially in the chromosphere. And the first feature, as I said, is the network. This is uh, the same thing that is associated with granulation, uh, super granulation, where there are um, bundles of magnetic field that move through the uh, cell uh, edges of the cell of granulation. And that forms uh, something like a network in which you see over here in this case. The next uh, feature that you would see is uh, you would see a dark thread like feature in this image, which was maybe evident in this. This thread like feature the, uh, that you see, and uh, very close to the uh, spots, you see a bright uh, white patch. These are called plages. Plages and faculae that we see on the spots um, or on the surface of the photosphere seem to look very similar. It's just they are in two different layers of atmosphere. So we just name them separately. But till date, we do not know if they are really correlated or not. Um, but both of it has got to do with uh, the magnetic field lines that are linked uh, well below. The uh, next feature that we see in the chromosphere is prominence. These are the hair-like features that you see along the uh, edges of the chromosphere. And prominence are very interesting. So when sun is quiet, nothing is happening. Prominence just remains there for days together doing nothing. However, we know that sun rotates. So as a result, what you see is if there is a magnetic field line that is present on the surface of the sun, along the equator, we know that sun rotates much faster because it's primarily a plasma ball. And uh, each layer of the um, you know, sun rotates at different speeds. And this is called differential rotation. So as a result of differential rotation, what happens is some of the magnetic field is pulled much faster and the magnetic field lines which are near to the pole uh, are still lagging behind. So as a result, there are shock that is uh, driven on the surface of the sun, which leads to formation of active regions. And these shocks can in fact break uh, the magnetic field lines in the prominence and produce flares. Um, so usually prominence is used as precursor for flare. They help or they trigger flare and then they go away. Um, so these are uh, essential uh, workhorse for what is happening in the corona, which we will look at in uh, later slides. And the last feature that I want to speak about is spectrums. These are jet-like uh, feature that keeps popping up uh, on uh, sun. It's more like, for me, I look at it as a disco light. So it just keeps uh, throwing some light constantly. And uh, we do not know what causes it uh, yet. So despite having so much of resolution, so much of data, uh, there are a lot of these, uh, what triggers them to do certain things is still not uh, very well. Uh, understood at least. This is chromosphere for sun. However, chromosphere for stars are going to look boring, of course, because we don't have images again. Um, but what we do have is we do see these plages and we definitely see prominence in one format or the other. And for that, we go uh, and rely on spectra again. And one of the strongest um, uh, spectral feature that is observable from ground uh, is the singly ionized uh, calcium. So in quantum state four, what happens is the singly uh, ionized um, calcium 
transitions from uh, E three half level to S half level. And as a result, it emits a photon that is around 39, 33 angstrom. This is called as calcium K line. And this was for first time discovered by Fraunhofer. And this is one of the Fraunhofer lines uh, that we know about. And similarly, uh, from T half level, there is another transition uh, that takes place to the same ground state. And that emits around 3968 angstrom. And these two together are the calcium H and K lines um, that is famously known when it comes to stellar uh, physics or stellar observational astronomy, at least. And these uh, calcium H and uh, K lines seem to be extremely sensitive to what happens uh, in the surface of the sun and magnetic field on the sun. So when magnetic field strength is higher, they tend to undergo these transition and the emission becomes much higher. So one uh, person, Olin uh, Wilson, he came up with a brilliant idea to use this line as a tracker for understanding activity of stars and hence a nice survey called as Mount Wilson survey was born. And what Mount Wilson survey did was looked at hundreds of stars in this calcium H and K uh, region. And what it did find was a interesting relation. So what we do is first observe a star using this calcium H and K line. We measure the emission in this region and compare it with pseudo-continuum uh, spectra that we measure. And we uh, have a relationship called as S index that is created. And this is converted into a term called as RHK. So you just take the temperature of any star and take its corresponding S index and bring it in one unit. It's more like luminosities that we do or L sun, right? So you have the distance or to the star and you have the luminosity and you bring it to one scale and you uh, use that for comparing with other stars. So to compare with other stars, this unit was discovered and this is a dimensionless uh, unit. And what was seen was this is primarily the emission in H and K lines uh, as a function of age. The older the star, the emission uh, minus five is lower than minus four, right? So the older the star, the less active the star is or less emission in calcium H and K. The younger the star, they are more active. So this was uh, an interesting relationship that was found, which means that our sun, which has a, a RHK value of around minus 5.5, is much, much older star, and which we can see from here, uh, because the age is in million years in this case, uh, at least we can understand that. But the main reason this calcium H and K was monitored was to look at whether there is anything that looks analogous to our sun, whether uh, there is a temporal evolution that is analogous to our sun on a long-term cycle uh, variability scale. And what you see here is this calcium S index over a long period of time for a lot of stars that were carried out. And I just showed two stars over here, which shows varying uh, time periods. So again, stars can have different kinds of activity cycles over a long period. However, what they did find is nearly 60% of the stars that were monitored seem to have nice activity cycle like what we see here. Nearly 25% of these stars had irregular activity cycles. Once they show activity cycle, then they don't show. And again, uh, the cyclic variation was seen. However, they did find around 15% of these stars that were monitored had flat, uh, literally no variation. So this was something completely new. We do not know why some of these stars do not show this variation at all. But at the same point of time, if you did look at our sun 
in 1600s, at some point, our sun was also flat, um, almost with no activity variation. So say you were sitting in Proxima Centauri and we are uh, in Proxima Centauri and looking at our sun and monitoring. And if we had looked at our sun between 1650 and 1750, we would have seen that our sun would have had flat activity cycle because that was the phase when sun went into something called as Monda Minima, showed no activity variation at all. So whether we are seeing these stars which are flat because they are in Monda Minima, or whether these are stars genuinely do not have an activity variation at all is still a question, and maybe we'll have to wait several hundred years to find what is actually happening over there. With this layer of atmosphere coming to an end, I will not uh, further uh, speak about it. I'll go to the layer of atmosphere that is my personal favorite that is solar corona so uh, solar corona was also for first time discovered during uh, eclipse um, it was seen like a white crown around the sun and uh, when some spectra were taken they were surprised about certain lines that was detected in optical spectra and they did not know or did not have a reference to that from ground-based laboratory observations. And hence, these spectra or these line features were first called as coronium. So these elements, because we did not know, we just named it as coronium at that point. However, later on, it was discovered that typical temperature of corona is of the order of millions of uh, degree Kelvin. Um, which means at this temperature, your normal hydrogen and helium does not have any electron that is left. All of it is just uh, split and they are removed from the um, from these elements. Even some of the uh, lesser elements that are present, like carbon and nitrogen, they are also stripped off most of the electron except for iron and calcium, where they have fewer electrons that are left, rest of them are all stripped off. So these, in fact, were the elements that give rise to the spectra, which we did not have the reference uh, uh, spectra from laboratory at those days. However, later on with advent of X-ray astronomy and so on, we also found that corona is more because it works in millions of Kelvin, we do know that it should produce something uh, that is uh, in X-ray uh, region. So we started observing corona in KV range, uh, first by carrying out some balloon experiments, then going the ahead and doing some space-based observation. And when we speak in millions of Kelvin, um, and when we speak about X-ray, there is little or no X-ray that comes from the surface of the sun or from the photosphere because it's of few thousand uh, Kelvin. So when you look at our uh, sun in X-rays, you're purely looking at just the corona, uh, technically uh, speaking. And from that, what we have found is loads of features. The first feature are these uh, streamers. These are uh, magnetic uh, field lines that are protruding from the uh, uh, from the surface of the sun all the way to uh, the corona. And these are uh, usually denser material that is present, that is uh, filling up the loop. That's why they look bright white in color. There are others uh, called as plumes. These are, again, Similar to um, uh, plages that we saw, these are small structures that you see um, on the uh, surface of uh, sun. And these are closed magnetic uh, field lines that are seen. Um, uh, during activity maxima, you tend to see a lot more of polar plumes, uh, in fact, on the sun. The next feature is coronal loops, which you can see here. These, uh, my analogy is usually a water hose, 
uh, where you have water uh, filled in a hose. And if you just hold it, how it looks, that is what I imagined this to be. So there are millions of these loops that are present and they are anchored deep into the roots of sun uh, all the way to the photosphere. And these are essential. We will look at it later on uh, for producing flares on the uh, sun that we look at. And the last one is uh, coronal hole. These are dark regions. We do not know why these dark regions appear sometimes and they do not. However, they seem to be the source of producing high speed winds, uh, solar winds that we measure sitting uh, here on Earth, in fact. And keeping with the trend, uh, let us look at how uh, the coronal activity uh, looks like for uh, sun. And this is, in fact, one of my uh, favorite images of sun. Um, each of this is over 11 years period uh, that was measured. And this is when sun was uh, during activity minima. Uh, it's X-ray dark. Very little X-ray emission is uh, measured. Uh, and during activity maxima, it brightens up and you can see uh, how it evolves over the 11 year uh, period. And this corresponds to what I spoke earlier. Um, during activity maxima, you have more number of spots on the surface. When there are more uh, spots, there are more magnetic field. And when there are more magnetic field associated, which leads to more X-ray emission where there are magnetic field loops and uh, there is more denser particles that is present. And what you see here is the X-ray uh, flux measured on sun during uh, the same period of time as this. And you can see that the spots and um, and spots also follow uh, the same trend as that of X-ray flux. Now let us look at how stars look like in X-rays. And what you see here is a schematic representation of how we think star will look like. This is uh, Abidor. Uh, this is uh, a star that is much, much cooler than our sun. It's a K-type star. However, what is interesting is this is an ultra fast rotator. So the rotation speed of the star is about 0.5 days. Uh, it's less than half a day for the star to uh, finish one rotation, unlike our sun, which takes 27 days. And this has very well uh, defined coronal emission and magnetic field as well measured. Over there. However, what uh, explains this better is this uh, nice HR diagram. This is not an ordinary HR diagram uh, where you have the uh, magnitude as a function of color. However, this, each of these circles over here are those stars which have X-ray detection. So what we, uh, what I'm trying to say is stars emit in X-rays and usually they emit in X-rays because they have higher temperature that can be measured from outside. And what is interesting is uh, when you look at uh, this uh, HR diagram, you see the very well-defined main sequence. You see the white dwarfs, and you also see uh, red giants. So X-ray emission or corona seems to be ubiquitously present across all types of stars, at least. However, going to how um, how spots and how activity uh, cycle looks like in X-rays. So this is the same star, Abidor, that I looked at. Uh, this has been observed for nearly 30 odd years in optical. Uh, the brightness has been measured, which is shown here. Um, and this is a sine wave that is plotted. And the cycle period is of the order of 17 years in this case. Remember, X-ray measurements are not easy because one, you need to go up in the space to measure. Uh, second is they are super expensive to carry out X-ray observation. So we do not have too many X-ray measurements or X-ray cycles of stars. However, few that we have are really uh, interesting. And this is one of uh, that, the same of Abidor. Abidor is an interesting star because it's a um, foreground star 
for uh, Large Magellanic Cloud. A lot of them are interested in looking at Large Magellanic Cloud. As a result, EBITDA is observed by a lot of X-ray emissions. Um, and what you see here are most of those. For free, you get some data, and that is what you see here as cycle. It might not be well defined like our sun, but there seems to be a 17 year activity cycle that is seen in x-rays, which is consistent with uh, dark of spots. So EBITDA and its activity cycle may be similar to sun, but we still do not know because this is just one cycle. We uh, do need more and more observations to confirm that. So let's see in future how that looks. However, when we speak about activity cycle, one thing that we uh, know sitting here on Earth is during uh, activity maxima on Sun, you see a lot of auroral activity, right? Sitting here um, from anywhere on the Northern Hemisphere, at least. And these auroral activities are somehow linked to coronal mass ejections. Uh, that is coming out of the surface of the sun. And most, if not all, of the coronal mass ejections have something to do with flares that is uh, seen uh, in the sun. So going back to nice images of sun, what you see is uh, um, X-ray flare that was uh, seen in the sun. And what is a flare? A uh, flare is primarily some kind of magnetic reconnection that is taking place. Going back to our uh, water pipe um, or water hose uh, as an analogy, imagine you, you are watering something and there is a crack in the water pipe, then you have the material that is water that is coming out of the pipe. So these are what I look at it as coronal mass ejection. Whereas when I put a tape around that, the um, uh, pipe is again reconnected and you have the water flowing free, uh, freely. So this is what is called as a flare. So what is a magnetic, uh, what is a flare? Uh, you have these large magnetic loops where these loops extend all the way to the uh, upper coronal heights. And at these large heights, when there's a magnetic reconnection taking place, electrons that are present in these uh, pipes starts to precipitate and move towards the chromosphere. So we are speaking about temperatures which are millions of degrees Kelvin, moving all the way to something around 10,000 Kelvin or so. As a result, what you see is something that starts to evaporate. You start evaporating the surface of the sun, and this evaporating material fills up the loop which produces the X-ray emission of the flare. That is what you see here in this image. So um, what you see is coronal mass ejection, but then here what you see is a flare that is taking place on the surface of the sun. And if we remove the image of the sun, and if we look at how it looks in photon, so this is how it looks for sun in X-ray. So when sun is quiet, there's nothing happening. There's just the same amount of photon that is coming more or less. And when there is a magnetic reconnection, that is sudden rush of energy. As a result, uh, you see a higher influx uh, over here. And eventually, this starts to decay and come back to ground state. And this is seen also in the total solar irradiance. And what is interesting is we see the same for stars. This is a uh, um, artistic image of Proxima Centauri, our nearest neighbor. And what you see here is X-ray flare that was uh, detected a few years back uh, with AstroSat. AstroSat is a multi-wavelength uh, mission that was launched from India in 2015 or so. And here, what you see is Chandra. This is an uh, X-ray uh, instrument. Uh, it's, in fact, a workhorse when it comes to X-ray uh, studies. And what you see at the bottom is um, HST, that is Hubble Space Telescope observation. And just by looking at it, uh, you would see that 
HST seems to uh, peak earlier than uh, X-ray, uh, if you um, if you trust me, and look at it, there is a difference in the peak in this case. And this happens because of magnetic reconnection that I had mentioned. First, what you see is the uh, chromosphere that is evaporated, and this evaporated material has to fill up the flare loop to produce X-ray emission. So what you would see is the chromospheric emission from HST observations first, followed by the flare loop and uh, flare loop emission in X-rays. And this was for first time detected, of course, on Sun by uh, Newport, and this is called Newport effect and which we see in other stars. So it's highly likely that flares again are produced due to the same phenomenon as what we see in the case of uh, sun, at least in this case. And what is also seen is uh, during flare, because there is chromosphere that is evaporated, the fresh material is brought into the corona temporarily, and it changes the abundance of the star. Uh, so what you see here is the same light curve that I showed before, but it's inverted and each of the strip is along the time axis or spectra that I have plotted. And what it means is when there's flare, you see higher emission over here. And when there's no flare, there's nothing much happening. The star is more or less uh, constant. So you see that atomic species uh, elements are also affected during uh, flare because there is excess of photon. And this is of interest for us to look at because uh, abundances are something that we um, are interested in knowing because that helps us understand what is the galactic chemistry that is associated with or uh, what a young star um, composition was and how that affects, uh, say, a formation of planet or so. And uh, these are, uh, in fact, measured in the case of sun. What we see is the coronal abundance that we measure for sun seems to be completely different to what uh, the uh, what the abundance uh, of sun is in its photosphere. And there is an anomaly. This is because when you look at the ionization potential of each of the elements, like uh, for instance, you, if you look at um, uh, elements like uh, aluminium or sodium, these have lower ionization potential when compared to elements like uh, neon or argon. And higher ionization potential elements are usually neutral and lower ionization potential elements are usually ions. And neutral and uh, ions are affected differently by electric and magnetic field. So when we speak about uh, sun, no, it looks like there is some kind of fractionation that is taking place that seems to affect these low FIP elements more and making them more abundant than the high FIP element, which is really interesting because um, immediately we thought, OK, there should be some process how it looks in a star that is much more active, much more younger. And what we see is a vice versa of it, where we see the low FIP elements are depleted and high FIP elements are, um, are enhanced. And this is where sun and other stars, a lot of these uh, active stars are misbehaving. So does it mean that um, there is something else happening in these stars? We do not know. So this is a question that needs to be addressed at some point. What we do know is um, the energetics of the uh, sun's uh, flares, the temperatures and the emission that comes out or the density of flares seem to all behave very well. So here, what you see is the flares that were seen in the sun. And uh, here are the flares that are seen on stars. And although the flares that are seen on stars are much more energetic, much more luminous, 
they seem to behave similar kind of correlation between the emission measures and temperatures. And with, with that as first step, what uh, we've been trying to do is look at if there is a way that we can answer why Corona is hot, which I started uh, my talk with. And by looking at smaller and smaller flares, they appear to follow a power law. The steeper the power law is, which means the smaller the flare is, they seem to be dominantly affecting the corona. Smaller, much more frequent flares. And for that, what we do know from sun and solar studies is larger flares seem to have a power law of around 1.5 to 1.6 power law index and uh, micro flares or smaller flares that we see on sun seems to have around 2.3 to 2.6. And if we look at some of the flares, like what we saw on Abidor, they seem to follow somewhere in between. So we do not know whether these uh, flares follow, uh, fall in this mini or micro flare category or they seem to follow the larger flare category. However, the main problem in this is the way we detect flares on other stars seem to have its own issue. So with development in technology, with machine learning techniques that are available, we hope that we can start detecting smaller and smaller flares on other stars, which can maybe at some point answer whether there are smaller flares which are occurring much more frequently on, uh, so, uh, on in the corona of stars, which seem to heat the corona to millions of degree Kelvin. And with that, I will come towards the last part of the talk. If solar activity and stellar activity has been studied for decades, then why study? Now, why do we bother about it? We are currently in the era of exoplanetology. So um, day to day, planets have been discovered uh, if, uh, since last 30 years. Currently, we have around 5,000 exoplanets that have been discovered. However, one of the biggest hindrance to exoplanetary science is in fact stellar activity, which is shown here uh, because of activity of a star, it can start mimicking the presence of a planet because uh, what you see here is a simulated planet that I have shown, a planet that is of two Earth mass. And if there is a spot on the surface of the star as well, that will also behave similar way. Um, so detecting and finding out a planet, if we want to go to smaller and smaller mass planets, activity is going to affect. Say we solve this issue of detecting planets. However, the next question comes whether these planets will survive around these stars because what exoplanetary science wants to do is to find the next habitable planet, Earth 2.0. And even if we find 2.0, whether there will be possibility of life surviving around it. And what we have seen is a lot of planets are discovered around M-type stars. And M-type stars are much, much fainter than our sun. As a result, what you see is the um, habitable zone tends to move much closer to the star because of the luminosity distance relationship. So when the habitable zone is much closer to the star, an M-type star like Proxima Centauri, if it continues to flare, which you see here is a 27 day period of uh, observation of Proxen. And each of these uh, vertical boxes that you see is a flare that is seen on Proxen. And you can uh, see each of them have different ranges of flux. Some of them are in fact much, much larger than the largest flare that we see on sun as well. And if we look at what is the rate at which proxen flares, it's about 1.2 to 1.3 on an average day. That is during activity minima. And you can imagine how 
much of flares are going to be produced during activity maxima and what will happen to a planet in in fact proxen has three planets currently uh, which have just recently discovered whether this planet will be able to sustain its own atmosphere to understand this activity plays a key role so indeed activity is important however activity is not evil here you know? if sun was not active as i said uh, when sun entered into monda minimum what we saw on uh, earth for instance was um, was a period of ice age for 40 50 years where uh, most of the rivers on earth especially in northern europe was completely frozen during this uh, these 40 50 years and do we want to face something like that for that of course our sun plays a key role at the same point of time if sun is very active we know that it's going to affect our power grid it's going to affect us the um, uh, astronauts who are out there fixing one of the instruments as well so if we want to uh, understand what the fate of other planets are and what the fate of us on earth and other uh, satellites are then we need to know activity so i will end my talk it's still the biggest question is we do not know whether solar stellar activity is a boon or a bane and hopefully at some point we can answer this question as well along with millions of other questions that are there with respect to solar stellar activity thank you